what I'm going to do is kind of like a, a quick PowerPoint overview of like the key things. And as you see it, you'll see points that you totally understand. And now you're just reminding yourself of them so that you can be a bit more aware of your actions of body, speech, and mind in your daily life. And it's like a refresh. And then there might be some points where you've heard them before, but you always got stuck on them. Yeah. And you're like, I, I know that that's what they say, but what does that mean? Or how does that work? And so kind of like make a mental note. And when you make a mental note of those points, then um, I'll turn off the PowerPoint and my little head will expand <laughs> into full screen and then you can ask away. So um, we'll start with setting our motivation and we'll use the four immeasurable thoughts to do that. And uh, this particular version is from the Medicine Buddha Puja and it's one that I like. The word that you might not know is Dharma Dhatu, which means lacking inherent existence. But I'll just say this, um, and you can say it with me if you feel comfortable, and we'll just sit with the meaning and make this the motivation. So all sentient beings, who although self and all appearances are dharma dhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. So letting your mind reconnect with love, compassion, joy and equanimity. Okay. So now we'll look at karma kind of in a nutshell. So just some reflections on karma to get us started. Let's just kind of be aware of what karma is not. I think that these are things that you know, but I think it's important to keep coming back to it because we have such strong associations from how we were brought up, whether it's from a previous religious experience or whether it's just from the societal norms that get fed into us through pop culture, movies, literature, general ways the world has of talking. When we hear the word karma, we often equate it with fate. And that is not what karma is. Karma is not fate. So what is fate? The development of events beyond a person's control, regarded as determined by a supernatural power, or the course of someone's life, or the outcome of a particular situation for someone or something seen as beyond their control. So the key word here is beyond their control and supernatural power and there's some sort of guiding influence that is dictating what definitely has to happen or what should happen that is not karma so karma is also not destiny right the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future Nothing is destined, a person's future developing as though according to a plan. But we hear this all the time, right? He was destined for great things. They were destined to become diplomats. Like it's inevitable. <laughs> and that is not karma, right? That is not karma. So we're waiting for this hand touch, aren't we? Sometimes we're waiting for this like tap on the shoulder. We're waiting for someone to tell us what to do. We're waiting for someone to show us the way. We're waiting for an angel to guide us. And that's not to say there isn't guidance and that there isn't support. There is, but not in this way that we've kind of been trained to believe. So karma is not predestination, which is the doctrine that all events have been willed by God related to prophecy, usually with a reference to the eventual fate of the individual soul. 
So it's not preordained or predestined. That's nothing to do with karma. Those are not concepts that we hold. Now, this one I think is more common even for Buddhists, which is to think that karma is somehow justice, right? We think this sometimes that karma is justice. Karma is not justice, right? A just behavior or treatment, concern for justice, peace, a genuine respect for people, this quality of being fair and reasonable, personified by this blindfolded woman or a woman turning away, holding scales and a sword, Karma is not justice because karma is not personified and it's not so tidy as those scales. It's not so tidy. So we'll unpack that a little more. Karma is also not punishment, right? Here's Zeus with his lightning bolt, right? It's not a punishment or the infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for an offense. So hear that, <laughs> because even people that really understand about karma still kind of hear it as a punishment for being bad, like we're naughty children being sent to the corner, right? That's not karma. It's not retribution, right? There's not a punishment inflicted on someone as like vengeance for a wrong or criminal act, right? There's no one kind of retaliating or getting back at us for having been naughty or having been bad. There's no retribution related to karma. But it's also not a reward, right? We're not like, if we're a good kid, we'll get candy, right? There's nothing gonna be given to us in recognition of our service, effort or achievement. Right? In the verb sense, to make a gift of something in recognition of their services, right? Like an engineer who supervised the work was rewarded with a bonus. Karma is not like that. Okay. And so, even though you know, it's so easy to slip into this. Okay. It's so easy to slip into these old understandings. So, just cross them out in your head, right? Karma is not fate, destiny, predestination, punishment, retribution, reward, a judge of justice, a jury administering justice, because karma is not personified, though it is personal. So karma is experienced on a personal level, but there's not a person or a divine being dictating, you get this and you get that you were bad and you were good, here's why these things will happen in this kind of dictatorial way or parental way or divine way. So it is action, meaning mental intention, also related to verbal and physical actions, also related to the consequences of actions, the result or effect of an action or condition. So this word consequence has a negative connotation. But remember, a consequence, generally speaking, is a neutral thing. It's just the result or the effect of when things come together in a certain way. So it could be a positive consequence, a pleasant consequence, or a negative and unpleasant consequence. It's just a result. Right? So remember what we know. This is just straight from the dictionary, right? The origin is interesting from late Middle English, to follow closely, following closely. So mental intention is karma. However, there is a difference between karma, a karmic path, and an affliction. So for more, you can see the Lam Rim Chenmo by Lama Tsongkhapa, or the foundation of Buddhist practice by His Holiness. But um, just kind of mix those words in your head. Karma is action and the consequences of actions. Karma is action <laughs> and the consequences of action. Karma is an extremely hidden phenomena, which is as opposed to manifest phenomena, like the water in my glass that appears to my eye primary consciousness, observing it in front of me. That's manifest, I can see it. There's a direct experience. Karma is not direct like that. It's not manifest. It's also not generally hidden. 
like the emptiness of an inherently existent self that appears to the mental consciousness of an Arya Bodhisattva in single pointed equipoise on emptiness, which is a big mouthful. But what it's saying is that karma is actually more subtle and harder to penetrate than the emptiness of inherent existence. The emptiness of inherent existence is a key philosophical point. It's a key feature of reality that we need to understand. Intellectually, it can be quite difficult to get your head around, but experientially, it's actually easier to realize than karma. Emptiness is easier to realize than karma. So for it to be extremely hidden, what it's saying is that the whole spectrum of causation of cause and effect isn't something that we can get to the bottom of as an ordinary person. For example, you could take the cup and say, what are all the causes and conditions of this cup? And at first you would say, oh, that's easy. I could write a list. There's porcelain and there was paint and there was the potter and there was the inventor of cups and there was the particles in the ceramic and then you start to realize all of the particles, what were they related to? What was the story of each one of them? How did this shape come into being? How did this size come about? Why did the manufacturer decide to do it? How did it wind up in my house, in my hand? And it becomes nearly infinite. All the causes and conditions that brought this one simple physical object into my space. So you see how like on the surface, it seems simple, but when you really try to penetrate it, could you ever get to the bottom of it as an ordinary person with an ordinary mind? So we don't wanna run the risk of thinking that karma is simple just because we understand it to relate to cause and effect. So therefore we have to rely on our observations of the natural world of cause and effect and our reliance on the Buddha as being quote, a valid being and therefore his teachings on karma are non-deceptive. So it's a twofold approach to try and get some faith that karma is real. The first one is that in the natural world, biologically, environmentally, we see cause and effect. We see the way in which things have to be related so an apple seed can only make an apple tree. It can't make a mango tree or a banana tree or any other kind of tree. There's a relationship between the cause and the effect, right? Or the seed and the sprout. There's a relationship. Just as there's a relationship between positive beneficial actions leading to happiness, negative destructive actions leading to suffering. It's the same sort of causal relationship where things have to be of a similar type. So that makes sense to us in one sense because we get it about science, right? So you take that as one piece. Then the other piece you take is, what do I know about the Buddha? All I know about the Buddha really are the teachings that I've come across. And some of them are too complicated for me to understand right away but lots of them make a sense immediately. Lots of the teachings of the Buddha about compassion, about patience, about kindness, they make sense right away. And when I put them into practice, they work. So I have conviction that this being who taught these methods is not lying to me. And even more than not lying to me, that the truths that he is showing not the truths he created, but the truths he's showing, which are universal truths that anyone who develops their mind can penetrate, that these truths are something that I can develop into an understanding of using the processes he laid out. Because I've already done it a little bit with things that are simpler. So you can make an educated guess that the Buddha has our best interest at heart and there would be no reason for the Buddha to lie to us about something as important as this. So it's kind of interesting to sit with how do I develop faith in karma, convection in karma? I don't wanna force it. I don't wanna to pretend to believe something that I don't. 
but I can hold the idea that it does really make sense and there are solid reasons for staying with that worldview. So we have these kind of main things to know, but another piece of that is to ask yourself, if I live according to my understanding of karma, what if karma is not true? What will the disadvantage be? <laughs> and, and you, you think, think, oh, right, I, I don't, don't know that, that there, there are any, any. Because, because if, if I, I live according, according to the laws of karma, karma I'm ethical and I'm kind, and my mind is less cluttered and complicated with excuses and justifications for giving in to my afflictions. So karma is true, but if it somehow magically turns out not to be, living in this way is still a very meaningful, purposeful, altruistic life with the basis of ethics. So before we get into details of karma and how it operates, do you have questions so far? What karma isn't and what karma is? Venerable, when you're saying it isn't destiny, it isn't fate, it isn't a lot of things. Um, so it's interesting when you say it's action and it's the consequences of those actions. So it's both, yeah. both the action yeah, both. of our body, speech and mind what I think, what I say, what I do, and the consequences of what I think, what I say, and what I, what I do. It's all karma. Is, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's sometimes there's specific terminology about karmic path and path of action. And, you know, you get into the Lam Rim Chenmo, but it all gets into that category of that is all related to karma. And the Sanskrit word itself mm -hmm. just means action. Yeah, meaning action. actions and their effects. So that category mm -hmm. of karma is completely a description of both what you do and what happens as a result of what you do. Mm -hmm. And what you do has a relationship between what you get, which we already understand, right? We, we, that makes sense to us, but it's a very specific thing where, for example, if you're surrounded by people who are constantly critical of you and speak down to you and are disrespectful of you, even though you're a polite person and an intelligent person and a human being, so therefore innately worthy of respect, and you think it's not fair, it's not fair that I get treated this way. And it's not fair, but it's not, it's, it is karma, <laughs> right? Karma in, is not tidy. That's why I say it's not about justice. It's not about punishment. It's not about reward because it's not so tidy. What you're experiencing right now is from so far in the past, it's almost like it was another person who created the cause of it, even though it's the continuation of your mental consciousness, even though it is something you created the cause for. Even think, are you the same person you were in your 20s? Think about a terrible rage you had as a teenager. That's like a whole different person than you are now. Yeah. Right. There's a, there's a relationship. Maybe the similar things annoy you. Maybe similar things provoke you, but your behaviors are very different. And yet it is obviously that's the same person in terms of continuity. And you still have to have the results of your choices then, you know, just because I wouldn't get a tattoo now doesn't mean I magically don't have the tattoo I got when I was 18. <laughs> right. It's still there. <laughs> right. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. an interesting thing to think about with karma because we fall into the trap of thinking, I don't deserve this. Like the word deserve is too messy. Mm -hmm. Of course you don't deserve mm -hmm. bad things to happen to you. Of course not. No one does. No one deserves bad things to happen to them. But we still did create the cause. And that becomes so delicate with very amazing things and very horrible things. And that's why we get into some of the nuances of karma, because one of the issues is that karma expands. So you could take something minor, like, you know, some minor action of sexual misconduct that you never addressed, that you never regretted. And because of that, the seed just in growing and growing and trees and branches and fruits of that kept growing. And then a horrible thing happened in this life, like your partner cheated on you and did a horrible betrayal, right? And you might not have ever been an adulterer, 
though probably you were, just assume that you were, but say that you weren't, right? And you weren't in this life and you're very ethical in this life and you think, how dare they, right? Of course, it's still their responsibility, right? But it wouldn't have happened to you if you hadn't created the cause for it. They would have done it to someone else because that's their karmic habituation, that's their pattern of behavior, that's their stuff. They would have still done it, right? Because that's the dodgy kind of habits they had, but it wouldn't have landed on you, mm -hmm. right? Just like sometimes you'll have a boss who is sweet to everyone and then just like picks on you or loves you and is horrible to everyone else. It's like they have a whole spectrum of behaviors in their consciousness the ones that you bring out of them are related to your karma. So it, in a way, it gives you a sense of responsibility without feeling fault, right? It's my responsibility to kind of take care of this karma that I have, to cleanse it, to tidy it, to purify it, because a life with more resources, a life with more support at my level is helpful for the development of my spiritual path. Eventually resources and support will be less important, but at our level they are. If I want more of that, I need to create the causes for that and purify what is an obstacle to that. But not think that I'm bad because I don't have what I need because that's going too far and that's over identification. And that's not what karma is about. Do you feel the distinction? It's your responsibility, it's not your fault. Mm. When you say over identification, venerable, you mean like, oh, I'm such a bad person. I deserve all this stuff that I'm experiencing, all the bad things happening to me because I've been so bad. I've planted exactly. the seeds. And then you exactly. start feeling sorry or, or for I yourself deserve you all of this wealth. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's like, it's like an inheritance. You know, it's an inheritance of your past life mm -hmm. and you're a similar being to your past life, but you're not the same. Yeah. Because you're changing every moment. You're different than yesterday. So, you know, whatever level of like energy and fatigue and vitality and strength you have in this moment is an inheritance from your last few weeks of food choices and exercise choices, right? And sleep choices. You're, you've inherited <laughs> those choices in this moment, right? But how you function with it in this moment, you have control over. So you could be tired because you didn't sleep enough last night and decide that, that is justification for grumpiness justification for not doing what you need to do justification for this or this or this or you could just say I'm tired because I didn't sleep enough what do I have energy to do that's useful without pushing too hard or giving in mm -hmm. you know without it being such a battle of I have to be a good person or I don't want to be a bad person or I have something to prove it's like no one is watching <laughs> right no one is watching. No one is like giving you gold stars up in heaven. Yeah. You're giving yourself your own inheritance. And what you want to give yourself are things that are conducive to continuing your spiritual path so that you can kind of go from happiness to happiness to happiness to full enlightenment and bring out the best in people all along the way. Are you ready for details or did you want to unpack some of the isn'ts and ours? <laughs> Eleanor, you have something? We've got to unmute you. I can understand that with adults, but it's the children that I, um, you know, the children who are really badly abused, physically, sexually, mentally, you know, um, I, I have real difficulty coming to terms with that in terms of karma yeah yeah as as we should right because they don't deserve it that should never happen mm. you know we always start there they don't deserve it it should never happen the reason it happens is the perpetrator's habituation they have responsibility for that but it wouldn't have happened to that particular child 
if that mental continuum of that particular child yeah. hadn't created the cause in the past. Mm. So it's, it relies on a belief of past lives. Mm. Of course, the baby never did anything related to that. Of course not. But they are like a little ticking time bomb. You know, we think of babies as this like neutral, fresh thing or like innately positive thing that then gets dented by their parents, <laughs> right? They're not, they're, they come in preloaded. They're preloaded from their past life. They've got a bunch of good karma and a bunch of bad karma, just like everyone else. And then the conditions and many things coming together brings out what happens to them. And that's why working with karma is always a twofold project. There's how you're thinking about what's happening to you. And there's what you're doing about what's happening to you. So how you're thinking about it is how can I make sure I don't create more causes of this type because this trauma has interfered with my life? How do I make sure that there's no even whiff of this still in my behavior right now? How do I protect other people who are experiencing horrible things like this? And in doing that, and not retaliating, you're exhausting that negative karma, you're finishing it, you're purifying it, and you don't have to experience that same specific seed again. What you do is you can take them to court, <laughs> right? What you do is you can have, I don't know, um, rehabilitation and therapy and you know, reconcile if it feels natural, run away if it feels necessary, do what makes sense practically. And that's not a contradiction to how you're thinking about it mentally. And the more peaceful you can think about your own difficulties in life, and the more kind of objective and spacious, the more creative you'll be about your external actions to address the problems. Right? So that's why we have to get rid of all that past, I don't know, societal influence, literature influence, pop culture influence, religious influence that thinks that what happens to us is somehow what we deserve. That is not the word that we use in Buddhism. Nobody deserves bad things to happen to them. It's not right. It's not just, it's none of those things, but it happens because of karma. Can, can you feel mm. distinction? Mm. Yeah. So it's like yeah. if someone is not Buddhist and they're not in the mood to talk about this sort of stuff, you would never say it. Right? If someone says, do you know, when I was 12 years old, this horrible thing happened to me, blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh, do you know that's karma? Don't say that. What's wrong with you? Don't say that. <laughs> right? Never. Never. But to another Buddhist who is, as an adult, reflecting on their past trauma, they could think objectively, all right, so this horrible thing happened to me. Is there any part of me that is doing anything similar now? Maybe you would never harm a child. Maybe you would never cross those boundaries. But is there some way that you're using your sexual energy in an exploitative, objectifying way, even in your own consensual adult relationship? Probably, right? Are there ways in which you objectify your, per your partner and turn them into an object instead of a human occasionally in the moment of whatever? You think of them as like a chocolate bar. You're supposed to give me happiness. Do the thing that gives me the happiness. And you've made them into an object instead of a person. Or you want to dominate something or make something happen. That is still echoes and shadows of that extreme form, which is socially unacceptable, which is incredibly traumatic and which should never happen. Mm. There are still echoes of that behavior in your daily life now. And so you, instead of thinking, oh no, I'm so bad, you think, oh, okay, that's a project. Because I really don't want anyone to feel the way I felt. And I also don't want to feel that way myself ever again. So I'm going to make a project of not abusing power and not objectifying people, that's going to be one of the projects of my practice. Gives you a good focal point. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And then you can still tell the abuser that was completely unacceptable. Look at your stuff, you know, like not okay, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. You know, whatever makes sense given the context. Mm.
So it, it's a difficult conversation. And, you know, you guys know I teach a lot in Israel and, you know, just imagine, <laughs> just imagine how the conversation goes, right? Who is right and who is wrong? Everybody's right, everybody's wrong. But kind of needing to be the one who's right is part of the problem and makes the whole thing just so cyclical and never ending. At some point you have to just say, how about everybody's wrong? And we just like start from now and try and figure out things that work for the most people. You know, like it's like we forget our first lessons as children, which was try and share. <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, so um, let's see, where are we up to? It is 1030, it's 1039. Venerable, right, so we'll is do some time for, oh. Oh yeah, go ahead, Pia, yeah, yeah, go ahead for a question and then we'll go into some specifics, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, so I have this uh, vague question maybe. So I, I uh, totally see everything that you're saying about karma. And then I also listen uh, a lot about what you're saying about interconnectedness. But I never until yet sort of have heard them connected in the same at the same time. So my question is something like, if I uh, am a person that doesn't work at all on my afflictions, doesn't that mean that I also impact a lot of other people around me and trigger their karma, sort of this interconnected piece when I am not working on my afflictions or vice versa. Is that something that Buddhism is talking about or just me not having heard about it? Yeah, it's, it's definitely talked about. One of the reasons it's not talked about as often is finding the way cause and effect works together with the emptiness of inherent existence because things dependently arise. Bringing those two things together is one of the subtlest understandings we can ever come to as a Buddhist. And it's profound and it's vital and we need to try, but it's hard. Our brain kind of explodes. Yeah. It's like, but, but causation is infinite, but then nothing from its own side, but then ethics, but then, uh, <laughs> you know, like it is important to do positive ethical actions, but what is positive and ethical? There is nothing positive and ethical from its own side, divorced from context. You know, just like what is traumatic to one person is perfectly normal to another. What destroys someone's psyche on one hand to another person, they just roll with it. Everything exists within a context. And yet still we need to do ethical beneficial actions just without that tightness that says, this is always true in all situations. Right, you know, like the, the example they often give in Buddhism is the example of the two monks on a journey and monks aren't really supposed to touch women. You know, they'll shake their hands and stuff, but you know, technically there's not a lot of monk, monk and nun cuddling or uh, cross gender cuddling just because it makes things messy and monastic life is too complicated if children happen etc right so <laughs> that's the basic premise the two monks are walking along and there's a woman drowning in the river and of course one of the monks is like oh my gosh a woman's drowning in the river and he runs in and he saves her and he puts her on the other side of the bank and then the monks are walking and his friend says i cannot believe you touched a woman you broke your vow i cannot believe you touched a woman it's just so unethical and he said you know I put her down on the side of the bank, you're still carrying her with us, right? <laughs> because it's context, isn't it? It's context. Mm. He wasn't thinking, oh, that drowning woman is my opportunity to feel up a lady. No, <laughs> right? He was thinking, let's save her. Let's do the human thing, you know? So uh, context is key. So it's a really important point that you're making. The other point is, to think I need to deal with my own karmic habituation and I need to deal with my own behaviors because I don't want to be a condition for someone else's negative karma to ripen. I don't wanna be a condition for suffering. Now, if they don't have the cause, I can be horrible and it will never affect them. Yeah, I could be, if, if we're the only one left, if everyone else is a Buddha, just pretending to be a regular sentient being and we run around being awful, 
we're creating lots of negative karma, but they're not being hurt by it because they haven't created that substantial cause. Right. But assume that at least some of the people we're interacting with are just regular humans and we are a condition for their suffering. It does give us more energy to take control over our behavior because we hurt people all the time. Yeah. So think of karma like a seed and the conditions like sunshine and water, et cetera, et cetera. You can have a million seeds, but if they're never watered, they don't blossom into experience. So we might have the seeds for horrible things to happen to us, but we've never met the conditions for it to blossom into an experience. So hopefully we can do proactive purification before they ripen, but it's good to assume that you've created the cause for everything. Assume that you've been a serial killer, right? Assume that you've embezzled money from charities. Assume that you were a pedophile. Assume everything because we all have innate ignorance. We just haven't done those things recently and we wouldn't do them now, but that's not to say that with different conditions in a different life, we didn't make some really terrible choices. If we think that quote, bad people are a whole different species to us, you will never see yourself clearly, you know? And then you won't be able to do the deep digging that us polite, good, sweet, kind people do that sees the ways in which we still have a lot of hypocrisy and inconsistency. And if we identify too much with that stuff, then it triggers shame and defensiveness. Whereas if you just see behaviors arose through countless causes and conditions, I'm responsible for them, but they're not my fault and no problem. Or I have many good qualities and I have many beneficial things and I'm a great service to my family and my community and my workplace, but none of those are me and I didn't make them myself and I'm not an inherently amazing coworker or whatever. Those are all learned. Those are all conditioned. So be happy that you have them. Use them, but don't think that you made them because then pride, right? So over-identification with the bad, shame, guilt, defensiveness, over-identification with the good, pride, arrogance, blah, blah, right? Just don't identify with it. Okay, so we're just gonna do some of the details and then we're gonna have a break and meditate. And um, Miriam's gonna help you unpack all of this in future weeks through meditation. So right now it's a little content heavy, but you'll get time to kind of space it out and um, flesh it out and digest. So we've got the classics here, the certainty of karma, which is that negative actions are the cause of suffering. Positive actions are the cause of happiness, just the classic. We've got the magnification of karma from one seed, many branches. Or like, for example, you could be friends with someone for 20 years and then do one horrible thing and destroy a huge magnifying amount and it has ripple effects through a whole community so it magnifies both positive and negative just like a seed and you don't experience the effects of actions that you did not do you create the cause and then you create the result so no one is giving you their karma you're not taking anyone's karma if you're experiencing it, you created it. They are just a condition. And <clears throat> the actions you have done will not perish, will not go to waste, meaning that an action will have a result. A seed will sprout. The rest of the story is unless. Unless you destroy that seed, if it's a negative seed, you destroy it through purification. If it's a positive seed, you can also destroy those through strong wrong views and anger. So seeds hang out indefinitely. They don't go stale. They don't go off. They can always blossom into experience if you've created that karmic seed, unless you like burn them or ruin their potential. So you can ruin the potential bad so as not to suffer or ruin the potential of good ones and not experience happiness. 
So how do you create a, a full karmic seed? You, there's a preparation. So this involves our motivation, whether we have a wholesome or unwholesome intention to do something. There is a certain thing or person that is the object of our intention. And we identify that person or thing correctly. So you want to, right? You're preparing to, you're gonna do something on purpose. It's not accidental, you really are intending to. Then you do the thing. So you either do it yourself or you facilitate someone else doing it. And so it's like in the example of murder, for example, whether you kill someone or you hire a hitman, both cases, you get the karma of killing. It's just if you hire a hitman, they also get the karma of killing. So then the act is completed, fulfilling the aim that motivated it. In addition, we rejoice in doing the action. So these three are what create what is called a complete karma. So an action that's strong enough to bring about kind of a noteworthy effect whether it's a full rebirth or it's a strong experience within this life, you need to mean it, you need to do it, and you need to have acknowledged that it was done. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like, okay, you see a mosquito, you hate the mosquito, you wanna kill the mosquito, you do, and then you go, hooray, that's a complete karma. <laughs> Okay, so, oh no. So let's purify all of those, right? But um, it's not, you, you don't see a mosquito, you don't mean to hit a mosquito, there's a mosquito there and you just kind of move and accidentally kill it. That's not a complete karma. You killed something, but you had no intention to, you didn't even know it was there, right? So intention is key. And who has the intention is key. So if I kill a mosquito and I have the vow not to kill and I'm a human being with normal intelligence, that is very heavy karma. If you don't have the vow, it's not as heavy a karma. If you don't have normal intelligence, it's not as heavy a karma. Does that make sense? So there's like criteria about weight and there's, there's you know, lists and lists and lists about what dictates weight. But a lot of it is what you would kind of guess intuitively or what you would think about like from the law, for example, you know, the difference between first degree murder and manslaughter, you know, those kind of distinctions are very similar karmically, what dictates weight. But if you create a complete karma, what you're gonna have is a complete result of happiness or suffering. Yeah. So um, I'll look, we'll just briefly look at the results and then we'll have a little break. So the ripening result of karma is the body and mind we will take in a future life. The causally concordant result is the most important for us for our practice. That's the experiential and the behavioral. So if we've done something, if we, you know, if we've done a complete karma, what we will have then, a result we'll have is we will experience a situation similar to the ones our action caused others to experience. And because karma multiplies, unless it's purified, it could be that we did a minor version and experienced a major version. That could be the case for good things as well. You know, maybe you fed a stray dog and now you have as much food as you want whenever you want, right? So positive karma magnifies just like negative karma does. But the experiential result is one piece. The behavioral result is the most important one for practice because it's the tendency, it's the habit that will do that same thing in the future. So hopefully, like if it's a positive karma, say, for example, we were generous in a small way and we have all sorts of amazing resources now, hopefully it occurs to us, generosity is a good thing. It helps them. It helps me. I want to do it all the time. And you have this habit of generosity. The problem is, is that the opposite can be true. If you have a habit of miserliness and stealing even, then you're going to want to 
Yeah, it's like a wanting to or a craving to do the same thing again and again. In uh, psychoanalysis, they might call this repetition compulsion. So this causally concordant effect is that you receive similar things and you want to keep doing it, even if just in a subtle way. And then the environmental result is our experience of the environment and climate where we live. So it might be warm, it might be cold, but do we like it? <laughs> if it's warm and we enjoy the warmth, that's some positive karma ripening. If it's cold and we like the cold, that's positive karma ripening. But it could be that we don't like the climate and that we're always uncomfortable in the climate that we're in. And these are all environmental results of our past karma, as well as they say the literal things in the environment, like from a very rocky road with lots of cracks and crevasses, that's from harsh speech. <laughs> or if things smell really terribly, that's from sexual misconduct. You know, so there is also a literal physical aspect. And if you're in a place where people are all having similar experiences, you've all created similar causes. And it, we can call that communal karma, even though each individual did it themselves. So um, fun facts, right, <laughs> about karma. And um, the question is, how do we purify karma? And there are two classic ways, and we're going to do one of them after the break. <laughs> so we'll do one of the classic ways. Basically, you do something related to the relative or something related to the ultimate. So related to the relative you're gonna be practicing what are called the four opponent powers, which are basically the ingredients that kill negative karmic seeds or burn negative karmic seeds so that they can't give you suffering. In terms of the ultimate, you meditate on the emptiness of inherently existent self, action, object. But that requires a knowledge of that philosophical system. So you can think in general about context and about interdependence and that will help. But for us, it's probably better to do four opponent powers because it's very specific and accessible. So um, if you have any uh, lingering questions, type them into the chat during the break and we'll have just a, a 10 minute break. Does that work out? Yeah, okay. consider a few things that have been eating us a little bit <laughs> okay so now is not the time to do your worst regrets of your whole life do that some other time when you have a lot of space when you have support afterwards when you have some people that you can debrief with or you can have a sleep or walk in nature or something like that we're going to do kind of mid-range mistakes <laughs> mid-range mistakes um and the categories basically are just physically, verbally, mentally. What have you gotten up to that is on your mind a little bit? And basically what you're doing is immediately stopping the ability of that negative karma to multiply. And hopefully if your regret is strong enough, you cancel it completely. So really think of karma like seeds, seeds that you're burning. You burn your good seeds, unfortunately, when you have very strong hatred and anger or very strong unethical wrong views. That's what takes your good karma and makes them no longer able to give you happiness. For your negative karma, purification is needed, but the key element is regret. So regret is completely different to guilt. Regret is a very empowering mind that thinks, I have Buddha nature, my mistakes came from ignorance. I need to interrupt the flow of actions done from ignorance by addressing them very honestly and directly and saying that fault is a fault. 
but without any kind of identification that then goes on to say, therefore I'm bad, or therefore I need to be punished, or therefore I should feel bad about it in order to make up for having done it. And that's a huge piece that in a way we've been trained to do, maybe not sat down at our mother's knee and trained to do, but somehow we think we have to feel bad because we did bad, because that somehow makes up for having done bad. The bad feeling is the price I pay for my mistake. And that is not regret. Regret is much more if you're walking across your living room with a glass of water that's too full and you spilled some and you go, whoops, I spilled some. You don't think you're bad. You think you made a mistake. And it's not a cosmic mistake because it was just water. Yeah. And you did sort of know better, but you risked it. <laughs> you know, I'll fill it a little too far. I'll walk steadily. Oh, no, I didn't. You don't think you're a horrible person for spilling water. You just think, oh, I made a mistake. I misjudged my ability for balance and stability. That's the way we need to think of faults. So you still clean up your mess, but you're not bad because you made a mess. Okay. So we're going to look at, okay, physically, just think for a second before we even do the meditation, just have them kind of primed and ready. Actions of killing or taking life, actions of stealing or taking what hasn't been freely offered or not returning things that you've borrowed or taking for granted the possessions of others or downloading stuff off the internet, even though you know it wasn't freely offered and it belongs to someone um, or sexual misconduct, namely related to like adultery, betrayal, misuse of sexual energy, things that were harmful, right? We don't have to go into some sort of old fashioned moralistic discussion. Everybody in consensual, healthy relationships, that's your business, right? We're talking about betrayal or harm. So physically, you just think, all right, is there anything that comes to mind that's not like my worst mistake, but is a little bit problematic? Like you were gardening and you were cutting through all the worms with total carelessness and you didn't care that you hurt them or, you know, you just bug bombed your house or something like that. Stealing, you know, were you taking things for granted? You know, did you steal the pens at work? I don't know what you get up to. Or maybe, you know, there was something you did in your youth that really was a mistake and you can forgive yourself. You know, you were just a kid, but really it was a mistake and you don't want that habit to continue. And then some way that you've, you know, misused your sexual energy at some point in the past. So you just think, okay, before the eyes of Vajrasattva, the embodiment of purification energy, this radiant white Buddha, who is really showing me my own potential. That Buddha, that enlightened energy, knows why I made my mistakes even better than I did and has no harsh judgment. Is absolutely accepting and loving and gets the whole story and is just holding you and is so happy that you finally saw yourself and took responsibility. You know, just like a, a parent so happy when a child realizes that they made a mistake and are trying to work. They're not punished just like bad. And so you think that you're confessing, but not to someone who's gonna punish you, but to someone who's gonna hold you. Yeah, and really to your own self. And then you think verbally, all right, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, you know, um, senseless speech, gossipiness. What do I get up to? You know, not the worst thing you've ever said, but something that you say often that's really not okay. Maybe a certain way you talk about politics isn't about collaborating to find solutions or finding ways forward, but is just whinging. Yeah, it's just whining and just provocative and kind of addicted to the drama of it. And there's no point in it, but you do it all the time. Maybe something like that. Um, maybe you say things that are true, but they're not kind. So maybe harsh speech is something that comes out often. 
and just kind of sit with, all right, what's just something related to speech that I would like to purify that I don't want to keep doing and I don't want to experience the results of. And then mentally they talk about ill will, covetousness, wrong views, but really we're talking about like aggressive aversion energy that wishes to harm or coveting energy, attachment energy that clings and is hungry and just like full of desire or wrong views that are lies you tell yourself to get off the hook for ethics. <laughs> yeah, um, they could be, you know, basically not believing in cause and effect, but, you know, certain ways you let yourself off the hook and say, I know it's bad, but I'm a special case. It's not bad when I do it. You know, just trying to catch wrong views like that. What are the lies you tell yourself? The biggest one is usually I'm not good enough. <laughs> yeah. Or if people really knew me, they wouldn't love me. That's a big lie. Yeah. Or, um, I'm perpetually misunderstood or whatever story is in your head. You know, we've got all sorts of stories and they were maybe true once or true in a certain context, but they're not still true and they're not always true. And we've made them some sort of eternal story. And that blocks our way forward. So all of these energies um, are energies that we can move through, shift through, purify. And we do that through this recipe. So you have what are called the four opponent powers. And Vajrasattva there is the Buddha of purification. If you don't resonate with that kind of imagery, you can just think brilliant white light. Yeah, the representation of perfect compassion, perfect ability, perfect wisdom, as well as my own potential for that. Just radiant white light above your head. And uh, his short mantra is Om Vajrasattva Hum. So we'll do the short one today because the long one is a bit of a mouthful for your first time. But basically with refuge, you're just connecting with healthy knowledge and observation of what your afflictions create. So like healthy fear, not panicked anxiety. And you connect with the ideals of compassion visualized as embodied by Vajrasattva or the light. And then you do your regret, mainly seeing a fault to be a fault. A remedy, for example, the Vajrasattva mantra and a visualization, but it also could be just a countermeasure, an opposite action. And then the resolve is like a promise that's reasonable and specific about changes you'll make. Yeah. So we'll go back and we'll do that as a meditation now. So just take a minute and settle into a posture that feels stable and secure. Relax into your space. There will be things on the screen as a reference, but you don't need to read them. They're just to look back later in case it's useful or in case you get lost during the meditation. But it's totally fine to have your eyes closed. And just be with your breath allowing surface distractions to settle. Use the sound of the bell to shift your focus further inward and onto the breath, specifically at your abdomen where it rises and falls, using that to center yourself and ground.
And now visualize above the crown of your head the embodiment of your spiritual refuge, either as Vajrasattva holding a door and bell, radiant white made of transparent light, or just simple light, but feel connected with the ideals of compassion. Feel held by that. And feeling held by that compassionate gaze, generate the mind of regret, of past negative, destructive actions of body, speech, and mind. Just one or two things physically, verbally, and mentally. Very gently seeing a fault to be a fault. Just like making a list, like a confession, but not one that is anticipating judgment or harshness. As if allowing air and space and relief in acknowledging the mistakes, not identifying with them. And think to yourself, both those mistakes I remember and those that are of a similar type that I don't remember, may I purify them all. And think that in response, streams of white light flow from Vajrasattva's heart center above the crown of your head, down through your crown, down through your whole body, flooding you with light, flushing you clean.
and keep the visualization of light flowing down and through you. And if it feels comfortable, you can add strength to that by adding the mantra. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 Om Vajrasattva Hum. and feel flushed clean from the shower of light. And generate the power of resolve, a time specific, reasonable promise about a change you'll make even if that change is only for a few seconds, what's something physically, verbally, and mentally you can do differently, less destructive, more beneficial. Make a few tiny plans to yourself before Vajrasattva's gaze. just very small, very achievable. And when you have your plan, your promise, just repeat it to yourself. So now think that Vajrasattva dissolves into light and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And all of those negative karmic seeds are rendered unable to bear fruit.
and dedicate the merit of the practice. May all of this energy lead to our enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And relaxing your attention. Okay, so I think we'll need to call it a day um, because it's probably getting a bit late in Cyprus, I don't know. So um, I hope that that was a good nutshell, <laughs> karmic nutshell. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, 